You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello and welcome to the Anxiety Podcast, episode 166. Today, my friend Jason Connell is back for the third time. And we're talking about meditation. Yes, meditation. So for those of you who have been confused about how to get started or what to do or what position you should sit in to do the most effective meditation, we're going to cover all of that today. And I will uh, introduce you to Jason again in a moment. Before I do so, head on over to anxietypodcast.com and there, if you click on the free tab, you will find a toolkit to help you overcome your anxiety. So get a copy of that if you haven't already. Also, the Anxiety Journal. Uh, It's probably a bit late to get it for Christmas at this point, but you could get it for the new year and start journaling into the future. You're going to love it. Go to the, uh, click on the journal page on the website and you'll find out more information about that. And if you want to kick off the new year in the right way, I'm also going to be taking on some new one-on-one coaching clients in the new year. So if that's something you'd like to find out more about, you can click on the coaching page and there is lots of information there and the opportunity to click a link at the bottom and book a time to get on the phone with me and we can talk about it and see if it's a good fit for you. Also, last but not least, in February, we have the Less Anxiety, More Life Retreat. What a great way to start the year. You should be there. Check that out at the same time. Okay, let's talk to Jason. Jason Connell uh, is a is now a writer, I suppose. He writes a blog on a very regular basis. He used to be a professional public speaker. He was a child magician. This guy has seemingly done it all. Um, but he's very interesting, and I love talking to him and his insights And it seems to be the way at the moment that if I talk about it on the podcast, he writes a blog post about it. And if he writes a blog post about it, I talk about it on the podcast. So it's my turn. We are going with meditation. He's written about it. You can find the link to his most recent blog post on it in the show notes of this episode. And without further ado, let's chat to Jason and get into more detail. Here we go. Okay, so Jason Connell, welcome back to the Anxiety Podcast. Thanks, Tim. I'm so happy to be back. Part three. This is getting like a like a fucking Harry Potter book or something. <laughs> <laughs> I was a child magician, so that is like way more apt than you would realize. There you go. Uh, I th- I, th- I, th- I haven't told this story before, but this is probably going to make my listeners hate me. But um, once when my eldest son son was a bit younger, some post came one day, and I put the post on the table, and I said. Hudson, there's something for you here. And he was like, oh, really? Oh, no. And I opened up this, uh, I opened up this bank statement and <laughs> read it out to him. And I, was, and I said something like, dear Hudson, welcome to Hogwarts. And uh, did my best Hagrid impression. And uh, he was like stood there with his mouth open and his eyes wide. And then... <laughs> Oh my God, kind of your poor son. Yeah. Oh, t- how did he respond when you told him, oh, sorry, it's just my bank statement. Hogwarts isn't real. Yeah, only joking, mate. Um, no, they thought it was quite funny. He thinks it's funny now. But, so, um, okay, how old is he now? 11. Yeah. Okay, 11. So, I, not that you or I or any of the listeners will do this, but four or so years from now, I would love to revisit this story and see how he's responding now. Here's why. Um, When I was six and my brother Rob was three, my parents (laughs) on April Fool's Day, sort of apropos of nothing, said, hey, kids, we've got we've got a surprise for you. And at that point in our lives, all we wanted to do was go to Disney World. It just seems so amazing. Mm. So my parents are like, guys, guess what? Tomorrow we're going to Disney World. <laughs> and, Rob, <laughs> and Rob and I like sprinted around the house, high five, jumped up and down, just like 10 out of 10 excited. <laughs> and then and then my parents like, OK, we've got something else to tell you, too. And we're like on the edge of our seats, just like chattering nails of excitement. <laughs> and they're like, April Fool's. And, and I'll never, I'll never forget that. But the reason, <laughs> the reason I want to check back with your son and, and his teens is because Rob and I read that as 
a green light to just play all these pranks on my parents. And, and, and <laughs> Rob was the real genius one. And they have, uh, I'll send you a photo of this so you can post it on, on your site. They have this small white parrot, Rosie. I love this parrot. And Rob, uh, so if you have a parrot, a nice thing to do for the parrot is to spray it with like a hairspray bottle filled with water. Like mm. it's, it's kind of like rain. They like to be misted. So Rob filled a hairspray bottle with blue food coloring and dyed my parrot's white parrot blue. It was brilliant. That's and it, brilliant. it all, and this is just one of dozens of pranks we played on our folks. And mm. it, it all, it all goes back to the time they told us we were going to Disney world. So I think, I think you've got a lot of pranks ahead of you, and I'm so happy about that. You could be right. Yeah, I didn't. I wasn't sort of a premeditated prank. I just, uh, I think, <laughs> I think like a new Harry Potter had just come out, a book or a movie or something, and so I did it. But um, yeah, I won't remind him of it in case he does use it as uh, as carte blanche to start pranking me all the time. Oh, I will remind him of it. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about meditation. We can calm ourselves down after all this excitement um, so early on. But I do love the parrot story. I, I like the fact that parrots like being misted because it makes them feel like they're back in the jungle or something. <laughs> <laughs> it reduces their anxiety. Yeah, there you go. Anti-anxiety. Maybe I'm going <laughs> to mist myself with some water and see how it makes me feel. I, um, I look forward to that. Yeah. Um, it's like when you go to the hairdresser and they have to get your hair wet and they kind of get it all over your face as well because they're not doing it very well. But uh, that's happened before. All right, <laughs> meditation. Um, so meditation, I'm really interested in in your take on meditation for a couple of reasons. One is that I, I think meditation is overall fantastic um, when used appropriately. Um, but it feels like there's kind of this big... Uh, amount of depth to it. And actually I was even speaking to a one-on-one -on -one client today and they were saying, I want to get onto medication. Where do I, medication, meditation, where do I, where do I start? Um, and what's the best, what's the best thing to do? And I think it's almost been, um, you know, simplified so much that now we have some of the online apps where you can put on your iPhone and do 10 minutes a day. Um, and that's fine. And then you kind of have the other end of the spectrum where it's transcendental meditation, um, where you kind of have to hire a guru to teach you how to do it and uh, and all that kind of stuff. And I, I feel like, for me, I'm still at the guided meditation stage personally. I haven't evolved past that. But I kind of would like to step into um, the next phase or the next evolution of the journey being one where it's more self-directed, if that makes sense. Um, and when I read your article recently published on the Jason Cannell blog, for anybody listening, we'll link to it in the show notes, um, it seems like you've you've kind of been through some of these iterations and uh, have some context, which is very valuable to both me and uh, the people listening to this. So I wondered if if that's a, a good enough intro to kind of kick us off. Yeah, totally. So seven or eight years ago, I, to to like put this in context, seven or eight years ago, I was sort of an evangelical atheist. Any idea of the universe or a connection to the universe or a God seemed absurd to me. And I'm not like for you and listeners, I'm not a new age person today either. I'm just in a stance where I have to say, I don't know. And I'm just sort of in wonder of concepts of God and the universe and in awe of them. But I was starting a business at that point as well, and was really overwhelmed. I mean, anybody taking on a new project feels like they're just drinking from a fire hose, basically. And in one week, three different people from different circles of mine, I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time, three different people from three different circles all suggested to me that I try meditation. And despite my stance in life as somebody who didn't believe in, in connection to the divine or connection to the universe, that coincidence, if you'll call it that, was so significant that I couldn't ignore it. And I, I spent a couple months trying different meditation classes and styles until I found one that, that works well for me. That style, and I'll, I'll explain it in a second, is called Vipassana, which is the Pali word for insight meditation. And when I found the, when I found Vipassana, it felt, this is, I guess, in a technical sense, an analogy, though it's very literally how it felt. It felt as though I had been forgetting to drink water for the first 20 some odd years of my life. And suddenly it's like, oh yeah, 
have some water. I mean, I was the type of guy who never had any silence in his life at all. Mm. And a very real reason for that. And, and I used to, we've talked about this in other episodes. I, I used to drink much more too, was because I needed to drown out the voice in my head. I couldn't focus on the voice in my head because it was tearing me apart and it was chaotic and it was distributed. And when I found a meditation style that worked for me, suddenly that anxiety started to melt away. And as I became increasingly comfortable with silence and with my own inner reality, I started evolving a, a much deeper connection to myself and to other people and to life forms. And on a good day, it feels, and I understand I'm drifting into new age territory, but it feels like I'm connected to something far more spectacular than just my immediate human experience. So that's, that's my background. And I don't know if you want me to pause there to, so you can react, or if you want me to briefly explain how people can find different styles that work for them. Yeah. I mean, I really love the flow of your article, so I don't know if we can work through it that way. Cause that made a lot of sense for me. Um, and, and in the article, you talk about the five ways meditation has improved your life. Um, so I would love to kind of go through those if that's all right. Yeah, totally. I, I don't have that article in front of me. Uh, so I do, I will work. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> what was the first one? So the first one is, uh, increased mastery over your thoughts and feelings. And you, uh, yeah, you told a story about oh, the conference yeah. in Paraguay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is a crazy one. Um, most are the default stance in life that most people have. And I was totally this way. And sometimes I still am I'm, any benefit that I talk about in, in this conversation. I'm not perfect at, but most people without ever realizing it, believe that they are their thoughts. So if you are thinking something dark and bad and evil, mm. most people tend to think that they're dark and bad and evil. And if they think something stupid, they think they're stupid. And one of the things you start to notice when you meditate is you notice that your thoughts are all running through your head. A huge misconception about meditation is that your goal is to empty your mind. You really can't do that. It's not really possible to think of, of nothing. Um, some monks with advanced practices might be able to do it, but for me or any other normal human, you can't think of nothing. But what you start to notice is the thoughts are spinning through your head and, and with practice, they slow down. And with practice, you can control them. But you notice that there is a you that is observing the thoughts. And then there is a you that is thinking. The you that is thinking that is creating your thoughts is not you. You are the observer. And when you start to realize that your connection to reality and your connection to how you experience life becomes so, so, so much richer because uh, it's a little difficult to explain in a recording, but most of the time we confuse the things that we imagine with reality. So if somebody is about to give a speech, they will notice that their heart is racing, their palms will be sweaty, their speech is, is speeding up. Those are all true things that are happening in their body. They will therefore imagine that they are nervous. And that is a massive cognitive leap that is divorced from reality because the reality is they've got a couple physical symptoms that are uncomfortable. Their palms are sweaty, their muscles are tense, their heart is racing. And meditation helps you observe your thoughts and divorce yourself from your thoughts. And what's beautiful about the practice is a lot of people can get there quite quickly. Now, the deeper level, many people experience life, and I, I think this is a, a nice way to experience life from an emotional perspective. But the deeper you go, you start to realize, oh, I'm not... I'm not my emotions either. And what this enables you to start doing is you can let the, the negative or the positive emotions ripple through you if you would like. And there's a lot of good reasons to do that. But you can also start to let go of them and you can start to disidentify from them. So you almost become your own eye of the storm. It's this really beautiful, powerful, calm perspective to be in. And when I think about how meditation has affected my life, 
I, in, until about a year ago, I was a professional speaker doing 40 or 50 dates a year. And I was supposed to be in Paraguay and I was getting on the flight from North America to South America. And I, my passport was stolen or I had lost it and I couldn't get on the flight. And fixing this problem was one of the most stressful things in my life. The short version is I had to fly from Detroit, which is where I was when I realized that I was missing my passport back to Boston, get a copy of my birth certificate from my parents go to the U.S. consulate in Boston, get an emergency passport, rebook my flights, work with the conference coordinator in Paraguay. Unfortunately, for the five or 600 people that were coming to see me speak, uh, delay the conference by about 24 hours, get to Paraguay, get off the jet, and get escorted on stage, all in one rapid whirlwind. And it was easily in the top three most demanding things that I've done. Mm -hmm. And I just remember consistently during that experience being okay and feeling the stress come up in my body, feeling the negative thoughts come up in my mind and being able to let them go because they didn't serve me. Like my job was to fix the problem, get to Paraguay, get on stage. Mm. And through a fairly basic meditation practice was able to divorce myself from the stress and anxiety and chaos that that situation would have otherwise entailed. Yeah. Cause you could imagine for a lot of people going through that amount of stress and then eventually getting on stage, you would feel super self-conscious that everybody the 500 people watching you were like oh god here he is turned up late and feel the massive pressure to perform or massive amounts of judgment yeah totally totally and as a service provider in, in that situation i think your job is to go above and beyond and delight your your customer or in my case your audience but for sure like if i had let the stress of missing my flight and losing my passport tear me down it would have and if i let the double pressure of an audience that was testy because I had just, you know, taken a day of their life because of an accident I, I made, uh, get to me, that would have torn me down too. Yeah. But I just never really attached to it. It didn't, it didn't bother me in the way that it would have had I identified with my thoughts and feelings. Mm. One of the things that you talk about, which kind of resonates with me is, is that I notice with people who, uh, when they begin to overcome their anxiety, one of the things that becomes evident is that their level of awareness picks up. So instead of chasing the fear, they be able, they get to the stage where they're able to be curious about it or question its origin or question how it feels in their body and, and kind of let it pass and dissipate. It's kind of where the, the three C's that I always talk about, where they come from. Um, so I think that's really in line with what you're talking about, which is kind of not trying to empty your mind of the thoughts, but realizing that the thoughts aren't you and detaching yourself a little bit. Yeah, totally. And I, I just earlier today listened to your, <clears throat> excuse me, to your conversation with Nick notice and you from a couple episodes ago, and you had said in that, that you feel like today presence with other people and with yourself is a superpower. Mm. And, and that's totally true. Like when you draw yourself into the moment there's not a lot to be worried about, really. The worry and, and, and bad things tend to exist outside the moment. Yeah. And it, that presence that you were talking about and that we're talking about, it, it's, it's hard to overstate how powerful that can be. Yeah. So that is um, a majestic segue into the second point, which is, um, as you said, I've found a deep sense of unity and connection between others, the world, and myself. So, okay, I, this one I feel pretty confident in. Um, for 20-something years of my life, I felt deeply isolated from the world. And then I, you know, in, in the human experience can easily, especially visually and emotionally be seen as an isolating experience. I mean, many people go an entire day without really touching someone, or if they do touch someone without really connecting to this idea of like, oh my God, like this is another leaving, living, breathing, existing human. But even ignoring that but on the inside, it, it so often feels deeply, deeply isolating. But then when you get a little, a little curious to use one of your words, you start to realize a few things. You start to realize, well, huh, if we are all isolated and we, if we are all autonomous, then that alone 
connects us. And that's interesting, but that's just sort of an intellectual understanding to many people. It doesn't offer any real relief. What you find, and this is a massively common experience in meditators and and many people that engage meditation will start to feel this within a, a month or less of regular practice. What you find is that the separation between yourself and other people or between yourself and other life forms is very, very, very likely an illusion. Almost assuredly, the greater truth is that we are all deeply connected. And there's a lot of ways to intellectually construct this argument, whether it's through deep biology and deep ecology or through the butterfly effect or the butterfly theory or through just this thought that like, you know, I am tethered to to history in my parents and my grandparents and great grandparents' genetics and, and the behaviors that they made. But what's beautiful about meditation or any form of contemplation that draws you into the moment is you start to feel that connection. And what I realized recently is you you can sort of test this in a way. If anybody listening has a dog, they've all had the experience of simply changing your thoughts or your feelings and noticing that the dog will respond. So if you, and this sounds crazy, nobody should take my word for this, but everybody should try it. If you have a dog that's paying attention to you, Think really happy thoughts or think, I love you, and project that at the dog and watch the dog respond. Flip side is if you think you know, you're a shitty dog, the dog will look at you confused or hurt. I know that sounds absurd, and had somebody told me that 10 years ago before I had any sort of felt experience of connection to the world, I would have thought they were crazy. But the direct experience of that connection that comes from being in the moment and and really paying attention to the world around you is so profound that myself and and many other people that engage with meditation, and and there's other approaches to this too, end up concluding, wow, connection is the truth. Isolation Mm. is the illusion. Mm. And actually, my last episode, which just just went out, um, was talking about it, it was titled serendipity or coincidence. Um, and it was based around the fact I've just been on a trip traveling in multiple airplanes and airports and hotels. And, um, I just decided to play all out in terms of human connection. So any opportunity I could get to speak to somebody and initiate a deep conversation, not just like, hi, how are you? But just asking people really what's going on in their life. Um, I was going to do that and I did. And it was for me, it was moving the amount of, connection that is available behind behind the face behind people who are just could pass you by like ships in a night and you wouldn't even see them but if you engage and ask questions and and be curious about people and show an interest it's it's astounding what is available to you totally and in one of the ways that we know that we are deeply connected is is what you just said a stranger can have a remarkably different life than you But if you listen to their life experience, you will understand how they feel or how they felt when they were going through something. Mm -hmm. And we can only do that because we have reference points inside ourselves that map to reference points inside of the other person. Now I'm talking, we're, we're using like emotional language here, but there's good science behind this too, like mirror neurons that, you know, if I smile at you, the neurons that make me smile will light up the neurons that make you smile in your head. It, it's really crazy. Mm. Crazy, but I mean, we're all the same species, right? So it shouldn't be as as much of a stretch as, as people think. Yeah, yeah. That's It's either crazy or it's not crazy at all. And, oh. and these days I feel like the latter is more true. It mm-hmm. feels like the connection is kind of self-evident. An ex-girlfriend of mine had this really great practice She would walk down the street, and if she saw a guy wearing a hat riding a bicycle, she would think to herself, oh, there I am wearing a hat riding a bicycle. And if she saw a little baby being pushed in a pram, she would think, oh, there I am being pushed in a pram. And I tried this when when we were together, and I thought it was a really charming reminder of the deep connections among humans. Mm. I had one which I think I might have... Uh, mentioned on the podcast before. I don't know. My, my whole life's really on the podcast these days. But, um, I was in uh, 
San Diego at this uh, resort place, and I walked. I remember James Altucher once said, "Treat everybody like they're your mother when you meet them, um, with that amount of care and respect and, and that kind of thing." Um, and I walked towards a lady who was cleaning the rooms, one of the the maids in the hotel. And as I walked down this little alleyway, going back to my room, I I just had this thought of thinking she was my mum, and uh, I love my mum as uh, as everybody knows. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I looked at this lady and smiled at her and actually emotionally felt that, um, she was, she was Mexican, so spoke Spanish and we didn't have any, uh, verbal communication, but I just stopped and smiled and kind of respected her and just said, I hope you're having a great day. And she just like her face lit up and she smiled back at me and said, you know, gracias or something like that. And I carried on my way, but we had like this moment of connection and it was because, you know, I made it happen through what I was thinking when, when I went into the engagement, you know? Yeah. And that's so real. I I love that. That, An exercise I've been doing recently and I've been borderline begging my friends to do this is about once an hour. And I got this from a book called um, joy on demand by, I, I forget the author's name. He refers to himself as Meng, but I forget his full name. Um, it's called joy and demand. And a practice in that is once an hour to find two people that are in the same space as you Mm. and just quietly in your head, wish for that person to be happy. So the entire practice is think of two people say to yourself, I wish for this person to be happy. And I wish for that person to be happy and then resume doing what you're doing. And and just like you asking the, the cleaning lady, Hey, how are you? What it does for me is it like solidifies the reality that this person in front of me is a human and they are dealing with their own stuff right now. And they are totally worthy of happiness and time and love and respect and energy and all that stuff. And I end up feeling weirdly connected to people uh, when I do that. Mm. That's a beautiful thing. Um, I wanted to move on to talk about... um this next one, because I think it's just it's fascinating for everybody listening. So you've it says you've gained easy and fluid access to your own innate resilience, confidence, calm, and courage. Yeah, um, I, I want some of that. Tell me how <laughs> you have you have that in <laughs> spades, my friend, and have helped you know literally tens of thousands of people find their own. But the way that I do it, and we we talked about this a couple minutes ago, it's really easy for me to become captivated by my thoughts and for me to be purely reactive in any situation. And that, as far as I can tell, is the default way for people to move through the world. But, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing Viktor Frankl here. What Viktor Frankl says is that in between stimulus and response, there is a pause. And that pause is always, always, always this present moment. And when you learn to observe your thoughts and meditation is one of a handful of tools that will let you do that. When you learn to observe your feelings, you can start to live in that pause between stimulus and response. So the world will come beating down at your door with things that are going to stress you out and piss you off and upset you or deprive you of something you really, really, really wanted. And if you don't learn how to center yourself in the moment, you become this purely reactionary creature. And that's how most of us are. And if I'm being transparent, that's how I am sometimes too. We, we all adopt that position periodically. But the more awareness you gain of yourself and of your power and of your ability to connect to the moment, you realize, huh, I could just as quickly let this stress me out as I could pause, take control of the situation and control it. And then at a deeper level, what I've learned from, from meditation and from sitting with my thoughts and my feelings is that when I allow what is a big practice of meditation it is allowing whatever is to be as it is. And, and that tends to refer to your internal world. So when we feel stress or anxiety or fear, we tend to distract ourselves or we tend to not engage with the thing that's causing us the stress or the anxiety or the fear. But very often 
Those are the exact same things that we should be engaging with. So when you learn to live in the space between stimulus and response, when you learn to live in the eye of the storm, you can confront your fear, stress, anxiety more directly. And here's the really beautiful thing. And and when I said it's affected my confidence, this is what I meant. You learn that you can, and this is technically true of everyone, though almost nobody realizes it, you can handle or you have handled every single thing that life has thrown at you thus far. Every single person listening will continue to be able to handle everything that the world throws at them until their time on earth is done. And when you can realize that directly and you stare directly into the fear, the stress, the anxiety, you gain this weird power over it. And this sounds so fantastical, but I I don't want people to take my word for it. I just want them to try it. When you accept the stress, the fear, the anxiety, it starts to melt away. It's so weird. And and I don't know why they don't teach us this in kindergarten because it's so consistent among people as well. And you notice that resting beneath the antagonistic emotion is what Camus calls this eternal spring. There's, There's this calm sense of confidence and that everything is okay and that you can handle this. Now, the way most people experience it at first is as though it's very turbulent, you know, the sense of confidence and, and anxiety and fear wrestle all with one another. But the more you allow that wrestling to happen, the more you grow the part of you that is confident, the more you grow the part of you that knows he or she can handle it. Yeah, I love that. I like the the eternal spring is... Uh... Is it make, creates a nice picture in your mind, right? Yeah, it's beautiful. I, I'm going to butcher the quote, but I think the full quote is, amidst the dark winter I found within me, there is an eternal spring or something like that mm. from Albert Camus. Yeah. So the, the last point on your list really talks about the, the benefits of meditation, um, which I think most people are aware of, you know, decreased anxiety, which is why we wanted to talk about it today. Um, increased happiness, the ability to focus. Um, so maybe we could move into how to meditate. Like what, how do people actually do it? Cause again, my, how I kind of, um, started this conversation in terms of context was talking about, for me, I'm aware of sort of guided meditation or really difficult meditation, which I've kind of steered away from. Cause I think I have to, I almost want to know it all before I even start, which stops me starting, you know? So, so what, what, what would you recommend to people? Sure. So the first question is, you know, why do this? And, and we just talked about some of the benefits, but the very shorthand reason is that we tend to manufacture our own feelings and our own experience in life. And most of us are doing it reactively. When you start meditating, you gain control or you gain better control over what you're manufacturing for yourself and and for the world. So to begin with, and meditation has become popular, it's become trendy, which in a lot of ways is good because it can serve people, but it's also really overcomplicated what meditation is and, and what it isn't. So at its core, meditation is the practice of focusing on a single point. Now that can be a breath, like your in-breath and your out-breath. It can be a mantra, like in transcendental meditation. It can be a flickering candle flame. It can be your feet touching the ground as you walk or as you stand. It doesn't matter what the still point is. Now, the next thing, and, and again, we talked about people believing that meditation is holding an empty mind, which isn't really possible. The next thing is that if anybody pauses and tries to fix their attention on a single point of stimulation or a single point of focus, like their breath, they will notice that they cannot do it for very long. Uh, On a good day, I might be able to focus on my breath for two or three minutes. On a normal day, I might be able to focus on it for 30 seconds before a thought pops in. The practice then is to notice that your attention has drifted. And once you have noticed that your attention has drifted, you bring your attention back to whatever still point you are focusing on, the candle flame or the breath. Mm. And that returning of attention to the single point of focus 
that is meditation or that is the practice of meditation. Got it. So it's just kind of, uh, catching yourself or realizing that you've drifted and then coming kind of recentering again. Exactly. Exactly. And then there's a lot of different ways to set up your meditation practice. Um, it's, it's funny. One of the most important lessons of meditation is to let it go and to accept what it is. But many meditators become evangelical about the style of meditation that they practice. And the truth is there is no right or wrong way to go about practicing meditation. There's even not really one way that is better than the others. The important part is to find a way that's going to work for you. Now, in addition to the single point of focus, many, many lineages encourage the person meditating to assume a posture that is both relaxed and alert. For most people, the easiest way to, to get in that posture is to sit in a comfortable chair with your back straight. And then there's a bunch of different approaches from there. You can listen to a guided meditation, both Calm and Headspace, and I believe Budify are very, very popular. They've got great ones. Or you can do it on your own which is what I tend to do. I, I set a timer and I focus on my breath for a premeditated period of time or where I think most people should start it. If they can, if you live in a city that has this is go to a meditation class where there is an in-person teacher and depending on the teacher's lineage, they're going to teach you different things, but it's useful to have other people around you. And it's useful to have somebody that you can ask questions of who will guide you through the meditation. Mm. So your um, your sort of practice yourself is just self guided meditation. Do you do it kind of once a day, twice a day? How long do you do it for? Well, no matter what, every single day I will spend at least one minute in meditation. The most absurd time this happened for me was I was a groomsman at a friend's wedding four summers ago, and I had forgotten to meditate that day. And I'm on the bus ride back from the reception. I am probably drunk. Sorry, I know I was drunk. Uh, and I realized, oh, shit, I haven't meditated. Mm -hmm. So amidst the chaos of this bus coming back from the reception, I paused, closed my eyes, and spent a minute focusing on my breath. Um, and in a more normal circumstance, I will spend 20 to 30 minutes in the morning before I turn my phone or computer on meditating and then 10 or 15 minutes in the evening. Mm. And then once or twice a year, I'll, I'll go someplace very secluded and spend a couple of days in, in a mixture of silence and meditation just mm. to sort of recenter myself. And is that the, the, the longer term one? Is that, is that kind of uh, something which you do and then stays with you for a period of time? Like it's kind of topping up your ability to sit still? Yeah, that's a great way of phrasing it. I, I know that it's time for me to take an extended retreat. And by extended, I, I just mean a couple days when my ability to focus is shattered. So I'll sit down and try and write an article or brainstorm for a client or whatever. And I just keep checking Facebook, Reddit, my email repeatedly. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a huge red flag. And then I go away, spend a few days recharging and centering and come back. And I won't have issues focusing for very literally months on end. Mm -hmm. So for people listening, I want them to be able to take something practical away. And, and although the recommendation of going to a course or a gut or a led meditation is, uh, is absolutely something we should aspire to. I also like the simplicity of just setting a, a, a timer for a, a minute or two minutes and just focusing on your breath and noticing when you, your, your mind drifts away from that to, to bring it back to the breath and just going through the motions of doing that. I mean, that, that in and of itself, once a day as a practice, people are going to find beneficial, right? Totally, totally, totally. I, I think everybody that's starting should aim to start with either one or two minutes a day. Yeah. And once that becomes something you enjoy and look forward to, add another minute. There's, there's really no need. Something that's often lost in this conversation Meditation is legitimately difficult. 
there is no need to make it harder for yourself than it already is. It's kind of like running. It seems like it should be easy, but it's, it's not. So I'd start wicked, wicked small. And honestly, I, I just learned this technique recently. If somebody doesn't want to do a minute, you can, in some ways, if you pay careful attention, notice the benefits of meditation just in a breath. And what I would encourage someone to do is to, after we're done explaining this, pause this recording, slowly take a breath in and release that breath. So the entire practice of one controlled breath tends to be about six seconds. And when you are having that breath, find, see if you can find any joy within yourself or any joy within the breath and let that joy be the focal point of your meditation. And many, many, many people will notice immediate benefits just from one focused breath. Mm. And that, that would be if one minute's too much, that's where I would start. Yeah. One of our, one of our former guests, I think it was, uh, Kathy Groover had, uh, an approach for what she called a mini meditation, which was, as you said, it's a breath. And, um, the, the difference was that she said on the inhale, on the inhale, she would say to herself, I am. And then on the exhale, she would say at peace. Um, and I've used that one myself to, uh, to, to great benefit. Just if you need to take a couple of breaths before a important phone call or just to kind of relax and drop your shoulders and just, you know, let something go. Yeah, that's perfect. I, I, I like that one a lot. So one of the bits that kind of made me smile, um, when I was reading through your article, um, was uh, a line you said, which said, um, some of the quiet risks of meditation. Um, and, and one of them said that for some people, meditation is a massive waste of time. <laughs> so could you talk about that a little bit? Totally. And I, I'm glad you called attention to that meditation is being sold as this panacea, as this thing that can solve every problem for you. And it should fit every single person, which, you know, anytime somebody comes to you with a universal solution, run the other way. So the two ways in which meditation that I've seen wastes people's time, or maybe three, one, they confuse thinking with meditation. What I think, as far as I can tell, most people do is they sit on their mat or they sit on their chair and they're so captivated by their thoughts that they become mesmerized. And then two minutes later, their timer goes off and that's that. Now, that is not developing a meditation practice. It might not be a strict waste of time. A lot of times people will benefit just by giving space to their thoughts, provided their thoughts aren't too destructive. But if all you're really doing is thinking and you never notice yourself thinking, then that wasn't meditation. But the, the real one is that, you know, meditation is not for everybody. A lot of doctors have been prescribing it. A lot of thought leaders have been advocating for it. But if you sit and you spend a month spending a few minutes a day in meditation every day or attempting to meditate, and you haven't felt that it has done anything good for you, let it go. Like, do, do not continuously punish yourself. If there's a type of exercise that you're not getting results for and you dread doing it every day, you would be a lunatic to continue doing that exercise. But somehow with meditation, we're told the myth, that's just what meditation is. No, look, if you've tried it and it's not for you, then let it go. That's not a big deal. Otherwise you're going to waste your time. And I, I attended a class about three weeks ago and the teacher had started the class with almost all this like external validation. He's like, you know, I've studied with teachers X, Y, and Z, and I've spent this many bajillion hours in meditation. But even if you were just a vaguely sensitive person, you could tell he didn't understand what he was talking about. And in fact, I think if I asked him directly, I said, Hey, don't mean to be disrespectful, but it doesn't fully seem like you've grasped this practice. Is that true? I think he would say yes, because it was so obvious and this guy, really well-intentioned, you know, he offered his teaching for free, but he had clearly wasted many, 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 many thousands of hours in his life because meditation wasn't for him. Interesting. 
So yeah, I think it's it's almost like letting go of of uh, and, and one of your other points is saying that you know you, using it for some um, expecting meditation to do something for you in the future. It's the same kind of thing. You've got to let go of your requirement for it to turn into some kind of result and just do it. Right. Yeah. And this is the real danger of meditation is like people will use it as a thinly veiled form of procrastination. (laughs) Like they will put off hard conversations and going on diets and making changes in their life and asking their boss for a raise and all this other stuff because they're meditating, meditate, assume the best assumption possible is to assume that meditation will not solve your problems for you and that you will have to solve your problems with action in the real world. So if you, and and the biggest mistake I see, and I see this all the time, um, is people try to treat their own psychological ailments like, you know, chronic depression or, 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 or paranoia or something like that with meditation. If you've been dealing with depression for a long time, try meditating. And, and, it, and if it alleviates your symptoms, terrific. But if it doesn't, the problem is not that you need to meditate more. The problem is that you need to talk to an expert that can help you cure your depression. And people will use it as an excuse to avoid facing reality. Yeah. And is that the same, you know, I hear people talk about spiritual bypassing. Is that the same sort of thing? So I've never fully understood what spiritual bypassing means, but I think, (laughs) I think it's the same. Yeah. Along the same lines. The flip side is like people will believe that meditation will give them all these magic powers. Like you hang out with meditators and yogis and they'll start talking about like monks that can levitate and different ways to time travel and get into astral projection and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. <sighs> the rule of thumb I abide by is if it seems like bullshit and you haven't had a direct experience with it, probably bullshit. Maybe be open to it. Like I do have enough people in my life whose spiritual identity and ability to operate in reality are so compelling that when they tell me things like, no, you can accumulate psychic abilities. I feel myself being open to the possibility, but it, it like if you are meditating so that you may communicate with aliens that are in a different galaxy, mm. that's, that's a bad reason. All that's really happening is your mind is imagining aliens and you're imagining communicating with them. Yeah. So did you ever use meditation like just before going on stage when you're a public speaker? Oh, yeah, all the time. I I mean, to this day when I'm nervous, whether it's like before a difficult meeting or if I have to give a speech or whatever, I will pause for a couple moments, breathe, meditate, center myself in the moment, and then resume going about whatever I have to do. And you'll notice the feel of the moment is so different. You'll, You'll feel anxious before you are, you know, about to get on stage or before you're about to get on a plane, if you're afraid of flying like I am. Um, and then you pause, you connect your breath, you meditate even for just a few moments and then you resume and you'll notice that the quality of the moment is better. It's different. The tension and fear is, is, is less than it was 10, literally 10 seconds ago. Mm. All right. So I want to understand sequentially how this works. So (laughs) I also know that you, um, have been known to jump up and down and run around and, and, and phone people up and say cuckoo on the phone to them. Just when the before. hell did I tell you that? <laughs> I have no recollect. That's true. I can't believe I told you that. Jesus. Mm. I have to remember everything now is liable to come up on your yeah. podcast. Let's listen to like tons of people. It's because I've been um, meditating. I have a massive brain, so I just don't forget. <laughs> okay. So for <laughs> listeners, I have this one friend, Clint, the funny thing, Tim, is hand to heart, I actually called Clint before this this conversation because I wanted to be really playful and uh, energetic for you, mm. and Clint didn't answer. But when I'm really, <laughs> Damn it, when I was a speaker, I used to periodically have to lecture for people way older and way better educated than I was. Mm. I, there was a conference where it was like several hundred college and university presidents and deans and provosts. And I was so nervous. So my particular sequence at the time was to call Clint 
Well, it was to down a Red Bull to sprint around my apartment, and I have wait, a wait, small. Wait, why are you down in Red Bull? You need more energy if you're nervous. So I don't. <laughs> I don't do that anymore. I, I don't drink caffeine anymore, really. It makes me too crazy. Um, but at the time, yeah, down a Red Bull. Because when you get on stage, you, you want to bring a lot of energy. You have to be kind of larger than life in, in some regards, or at least that's what I used to think. Um, so down a Red Bull, I'd call Clint. Well, it'd sprint around my small apartment, which is more chaotic than you would expect. It's small. <laughs> Um, <laughs> a lot of turns. It's just a lot of turns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's tons of turning. I'd call Clint. Hopefully, Clint. I can't believe I'm admitting this. Uh, hopefully, Clint would answer. I'd cluck like a chicken or a rooster, <laughs> hang up with no explanation to Clint whatsoever, review my notes, and then when I was brimming with this like playful manic energy, I'd sit, <laughs> connect to my breath, remind myself that I got this shit, and then move forward. So that, yeah. that was, and I still, I actually kind of still do something. I'll be toned down uh, when I'm nervous or anxious. I, I'll, these days, I'll listen to um, Don't Stop Me Now, the song by Queen, right. on repeat as I'm walking up, like if I'm going to a party where I don't know anyone or, or whatever, uh, to get myself really hyper. And then before I enter the situation that's going to cause me anxiety, I'll usually stand outside of it for just a moment or two, breathe. If there's a mirror nearby, I'll look in my eye. The, the practice of looking in your own eyes is insanely grounding and, and for many people, pretty meditative. And then enter the situation. And, and I notice I'm much more calm and playful mm. when I do that than when I don't. So do you think Clint's like changed his phone number now? <laughs> <laughs> so he doesn't get well, the late I, night chickens anymore? I, know, I noticed Clint's, the frequency with which Clint takes my calls has gone down over the years. I've mm. noticed that much. Will you be my Clint? I would be honored to be your Clint, Tim. Right. That would be <laughs> anytime you want to. I know you've got a speech coming up soon. Anytime you want to make chicken noises at me, I'm your boy. All right. I'm going to do that. Wait, can we? This reminds me of a story from your life that is like weirdly relevant. <laughs> oh, God. So you, you no, unlike, unlike <laughs> you, I'm not about to throw you under the bus. Um, <laughs> I think most of my listeners know a lot of my. My uh, skeletons well, they, anyway, so we're good. You know, the crazy thing is a six-year-old still struggles to distinguish reality from fantasy. Mm. So for you, for you to say, like, oh, you got into Hogwarts <laughs> is this weirdly blurry experience for a six-year-old. Um, uh, no, we were talking 20 minutes ago about how when you meditate, you start to feel a deep connection to the world mm. and to its people. Um, what I'm about to say to some listeners – will sound absurd. And if you are one of the people who thinks what I'm saying is absurd, what I hope you do, don't again, don't take my word for it, but what I hope you do is you test this. So here's what happened with Tim recently. About a week ago, 10 days ago, Tim said to, to me and a couple of our friends, he said, you know, I'd like to do more speaking engagements. And then literally three days after Tim said that, a speaking engagement came to him. Somebody literally emailed you, Tim, and said, I'd like to, like to book you to give this speech. Are you available on this date? And the weird thing with meditation and, and, and connection to humans in, in the universe is like, I don't know which direction it goes. The new age people always say that you gain the ability to manipulate the universe. You know, you build a vision board and you think of a Mercedes and you get a Mercedes. Mm -hmm. That might be the direction it goes. It feels to me like it's a little bit more collaborative. Like for some reason you're being pulled in the direction of like, Tim should be giving speeches and, and working with people live and, and in addition to his podcast. And then when you receive that nudge, it just seems like a synergy happens and, and you receive it by acknowledging the feeling in yourself. Hey, this seems crazy, but I'd, I'd like to give a speech and then owning it by telling your friends or, or admitting it to the world. You know, I want to give speeches and it seems to just create this synergistic effect. And I've noticed, and this is when I start to sound crazy probably, but I've noticed that like the more deeply I entrench myself in the moment. And again, meditation is one heck of a tool for that. Uh, the more, the less effort it requires for me to activate and live my dreams. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I historically would have said that that new age way of thinking is is strange and and different. But um, my level of uh, my level of ownership of you know wanting to to do the speaking and I don't know, I just felt like it was the right time. I felt called to it, like it was pulling me. 
I wasn't pushing it. Um, and I, maybe I could have done it sooner. Maybe I could have done it last year, but now it's happening and it seems just like a natural extension. Not that it's easy, not that it's without, um, some nervousness around what it's going to be like and wanted to prepare and make sure I got something really compelling that people are going to enjoy. I want to do a good job, but, um, yeah, I feel drawn to it. So it doesn't surprise, I mean, in a way it's like amazing that the day after I put it out there that I got the inquiry, but when I got that opportunity to do that speech i had goosebumps all over my body for about 20 minutes because i was like yeah this is of course like of course yeah that's the weird thing is like it, when we experience it purely cerebrally and we think about it it, it seems impossible or it seems like a coincidence but the the more i live the less i believe in coincidence and when you experience it outside of your head and more through your through your heart or just through for lack of a better term your your soul whatever it is that makes you you, I think your response is perfectly reasonable, of course. And what meditation will do, and by the way, I keep circling around this, here are the other practices that will help you achieve the same thing as meditation that I'm aware of. I'm sure there's others. Journaling will help you achieve the same effects as meditation, especially stream of consciousness journaling, especially habitually. Um, Long bouts of silence, especially in nature, like going for a walk for three hours by yourself, no phone, no computer. Mm. Uh, and if you can find a friend or a partner or a coach or a therapist who will meet you where you're at and you can engage in these deep, vulnerable conversations and, and really ask some of the bigger questions about yourself and, and life in the universe in those conversations, you will achieve the same thing. So in your word, Tim, curiosity. But I, I think like, I think what happened with you and I've experienced this and and a million other people have is when you generate the self-awareness and the stillness of what's true to you. And in that moment, it was true that now is the time for you to start giving speeches. When you become aware, like to borrow words from Paulo Coelho, the author of of the alchemist and a bunch of other amazing books, it, it feels as though the universe conspires to help you live your truth or what Quelo calls your, your personal legend. Again, if it's really the universe, I don't know. I don't know the mechanics behind this stuff. I don't think anybody does. But what I notice, and this is why I want people to try, is like it seems to work. Get in touch with yourself through meditation or something else with the moment, with your authentic desires. Express those desires to the world. Let go and watch what happens. Yeah. And there's, there's a catalyst and I'll shut up after this. There's a catalyst to all that too. And you've totally done this with your podcast. The catalyst to speeding up everything you want is to go out and help other people and serve them. Whether that's donating 10 bucks to a fund that's trying to help people in Aleppo right now, or like giving a dollar to a beggar or volunteering at the animal shelter or whatever. It seems like if you dedicate a bit of your resources to serving other people with no expectations and you get clear on what you want, you've become self-aware, you own that desire and you let it go. It seems like you get it quickly and and that's trippy and it's psychologically and spiritually advanced, but it's also testable. Hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how the mechanics of that kind of elaborate machine work, but I feel, I feel like it, that is the truth. Yeah, me too. Um, so I, I almost don't really need to know. It's just a case of, you know, like a lot of my stuff that I talk about on the podcast and with other people is leaning into fear. It's embracing anxiety. It's moving towards the things that concern us. Um, and I do that in my own life. And, and I, the more I do that, the more that these, uh, instances of what seem like serendipity continue to happen. Yeah, I, I've had the exact same experience. And I, I love that you also say that you don't know and, and that you don't need to know. It, it's weird. I think humans are the only creatures that do this. We expect to understand pretty much everything. And I think we're kind of flattering ourselves with that. Because if there's like a house cat wandering around my apartment, I have no expectation whatsoever that the house cat understands the world or the universe or or the dynamics within. Mm. But as a human, we've put these weird expectations upon ourselves to understand everything while missing the sort of obvious reality that we probably don't have the mental 
hardware to actually understand everything. We're, we're probably just not that smart. And, and that's even moot because we don't need to understand why something works. No. We just have to observe that it does and then trust. Yeah, I mean, that's the belief in the process. And just, I mean, that's for me, that's my my version of letting go of, of needing to know and just realizing that if I continue to do this and I continue to put out the and stay with what's true to me as opposed to what I think other people want or what I think would uh, appreciate or most most of the people would appreciate. And I, I'm, I've got Seth Godin running through my head all the time at the moment because I saw him on the weekend. But, you know, he said, don't try and appeal to the masses. Just appeal to what you want to talk about um, and the right people will step forward. Right. Wait, it's funny that you think that's Seth Godin. Because way before you went to that conference a couple of days ago, you said that to me. For, for listeners, uh, I, I was remarkably fortunate. My blog in the first month had – I started eight months ago. In the first month, it had like 300 readers. Today, I'm getting well over 10,000 a month. So it grew very, very, very quickly. And while it was on this growth trajectory, I was freaking out. And Tim, I had turned to you and said, you know, I'm broken. I, I can't write. I just write half a paragraph, call myself an idiot and a fraud, delete it. And then freak out because I'm, I'm afraid that I got all these readers really quickly and I'm afraid they're about to abandon me. Your advice was exactly what you just said. You think you learned from Seth Godin. Your advice was no recenter. Like, don't worry about your readers. Express yourself in a way that will help people and it feels true and trust that that will work. Mm. Um, yeah, maybe that's, um, maybe I just attributed something I thought of myself to somebody else, but <laughs> so maybe that's the secret to Seth's success. Yeah. He's so mesmerizing and lucid that we all think our good ideas come from him. Yeah. Yeah, possibly. But I uh, thank you. Thank you for reminding me that, um, it's a concept I already he- held in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. Um, no, but I believe in that. And I, you know, the more I do this, the the more, sometimes the most obvious, of statements don't always strike you until they do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That um, makes sense. And that's one of them, which is, you know, the, the truer expression I can be of. And now I, this is so fun because I get to talk to you. And I think that my podcast is just an extension of me. It's not a job. It's not a demand, although sometimes it is, you know, effort, but, um, it's not like something separate. It's just part of my life. It's part of my existence. And, and my responsibility, as I see it, is to live my life as, as best I can and as fully as I can and talk about that experience. Um, and if I can do that and other people are interested in it, then everybody wins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. The ultimate, I think, is to to set up your your life or your work in such a way so that it's an expression of you and your truth and what you love. And so that it's set up to help other people. Like in that situation, nothing mm-hmm. is lost because you get to express yourself and share yourself with the world, which is once you find the courage to do it, a pretty fulfilling thing. And yeah. this doesn't have to be by working in public. This can be by being an accountant, if that's what you love to do. Yeah. And then you benefit and everyone that encounters you in your work benefits. Like nothing, nothing is lost. That's what I think love is. Yeah. And I think like we were talking about the, the, the speech I'm giving is to a real estate crowd. Um, but, uh, and so I was thinking about when I was in that world, it was always about getting to your level of financial freedom. So then you can do whatever you want, right? So it's build up enough bulk of money and then you can go and live in Barbados or go and start a fish and chip shop or whatever floats your boat. Um, and I was reflecting on that today, this morning and just thinking like, if I did, win the lottery for one of a better, more eloquent term. Um, I would still want to do the work I'm doing. This is what I want to do. Um, which it, which is so, feels so satisfying, even though I'm in the middle of it. Yeah, that's surreal. That's your, that's the dream is to be in a situation where a huge windfall wouldn't substantially change your life. Mm. And, and that I, at the risk of sounding forced though, to me, it doesn't feel forced. One of the things you learn we have this narrative in the Western world, and it's a huge source of misery and anxiety for people. The narrative is that our dreams live in the future and that one day, but not today, we can start working on our dreams and living our dreams, whether that's becoming a guitarist or traveling or settling down and having a family, whatever. 
the reality is the future is exclusively a concept. It only exists in our head. If, if we all make it to next Monday, when we wake up on Monday, we will not say, oh, shit, the future is here. This is great. We'll, we'll say, oh, it's today. And this time or this moment is now. Mm. And that's how we will always, always, always experience things. And what's beautiful within that is that if there was ever a version of the future in which you were equipped to chase your dreams, or if you ever believed that that future would exist, you have to suddenly realize that, oh, shit, you can do it now. Like you can start living exactly what you want or creating at the very least exactly what you want now. Yeah. And it might take time for you to get the exact precise thing, but there's literally nothing holding you back from toppling over that first domino. Right, 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 right now. Mm. And, and the power to do that and the perspective to do that can come from meditation. And that the amazing thing is when you shift from the future perspective, which is purely conceptual, it's just a horizon line, it's a psychological illusion to a now perspective, is that people start their dreams now, which is great. Mm. And then, and you are a testament to this, the dreams grow much more rapidly and much more powerfully than anybody ever expects, yeah. if they're authentic. Yeah, and I, 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 a version of this, happened today um i was on the phone with a client and they needed to have a difficult conversation in their life and they said right i'll maybe i can you know take my significant other out for dinner or we can i can make sure that there's no distractions and i said yeah find a good time but don't wait for the perfect time because there never will be one and the the point of having the conversation is to have it right not to defer it and delay it and worry about it it's to to get it out there and so that's kind of how i've lived my life which is like I'm not sure I'm fully at peace with the what the future represents and that it's not real, but what I am at peace with is that I'm I'm not waiting forever. I'm going to do this today and I'm going to have that conversation today or make the move today or whatever that looks like so that I can change the future into what I want it to be. Yeah, a, a different way of looking at that same concept is that we know we can't control the future, even if it exists. And I, I would really sharply argue that it doesn't exist. But what we know about it, even if it does, is we can't control it. But what we can do is we can improve at this moment. And that might mean doing something hard, like leaning into a difficult conversation and getting it off your mind and out of your heart. But when you improve at this moment, the next moment is also going to be better. So, if ever we wanted to pretend like we could control the future or influence the future, and maybe we can influence it, then you would do it from the present. You would never do it by putting things off. Mm. I like that. And I think that's a beautiful place to leave it. Perfect. Let's do it. Yeah. This was great. I had a total pleasure. I can't believe I ended up talking about calling Clint and, and clucking like a chicken. That was a, at the time a very effective anxiety <laughs> management strategy for me. I think it's good. I mean, I, I was talking the other day I before I got on to uh, a webinar I had to do, which was a bit of a new segment or a new industry for me or whatever. I, I jumped up and down and played some music and ran around a bit. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm reading a book at the moment called Shaking Medicine, which is all about sort of flushing our nervous system and, and uh and you see it all over the place when I, when you think about it, you know, you think of sports people before they get on the field, they're often kind of moving. And I mean, I guess a boxer is a great example of it. Obviously they, they move in the ring, but most of the time before they get in the ring, they're jumping, they're moving and they're, you know, they're flushing their system. They're displacing their energy a bit. So they're ready to go. So um, anyway, yeah, no, it's, it's crazy. And I know we're winding down, but so often I think that I'm having a psychological problem. Like I'm, I'm, I'm depressed or I'm anxious or I'm stupid or whatever, but in reality, I'm having a physical problem and I need to do, I need to use my body for what it was designed for. And that mm. is like moving <laughs> and like moving sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly and picking shit up and all that stuff. And then after like 10 minutes or sometimes less, like a quick 200 meter sprint, I feel fine. I feel great. Yeah. Very cool.
All right, my friend. Well, thanks very much for coming on for round three. Um, I'm, I feel like there'll be more in the future, but uh, <laughs> I hope for, so. Yeah. No, thank- and no other podcast do I get to talk about my brother dying, my parents' bird blue. I'm going to send you a photo of that. Right. So thank you for having it. me, Tim. If you send me a picture, I'm going to put it on the website. I will do that <laughs> before I move on to my next project on the day. Cool. All right, my friend. All the best. Thanks, Tim. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye bye. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with my man JC um, and enjoyed us talking about meditation. I think the key thing is just getting started. Um, And as he said, it could be as simple as a breath or a few minutes out of your day each day just to kind of start building and cultivating a practice. So if you have enjoyed this episode of the Anxiety Podcast and other episodes of the Anxiety Podcast, I would be most grateful if you could skip on over to iTunes and leave a lovely review for the podcast. Also, if you listen to it somewhere else like Stitcher or Google Play or iHeartRadio or TuneIn Radio, all these places, all these options, we're so lucky, uh, leave a review there as well. And it helps us get the rankings up for the podcast so we get more viewers, we can help more people and take over the world. Something like that. Um, last but not least, if you have any guest suggestions or show suggestions, feel free to hit the contact page on the website. Send me a message. I would love to hear from you. And remember, until next time, less anxiety, more life. Thank you for listening to the Anxiety Podcast. For more information, go to theanxietypodcast.com. 